My name is Grayson Train, and this is Pro Lacrosse Talk. On Shriver. Snyder with scores. Now it's yeah. right. Padel scores. Paul yeah. Rabel it splits two and scores. Yeah. Kylie O'Miller showing off those shifty skills and finishes that shot behind Liz Hogan. Kelly, not shy, bounces one home. What a start. Welcome to the Pro Lacrosse Talk Podcast. I'm Hutton, he's Adam. Together we have all the latest news from all your favorite professional lacrosse leagues. We're happy to have you for another episode of Pro Lacrosse Talk. As usual, I, Hutton, am joined by my co-host, Adam. Adam, how you doing today, bud? I'm good, man. Just walked in the door, actually, from my third Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu class, so... Thought I'd get my butt off the couch and uh, get active again. Um, so I'm exhausted, not going to lie. I got beat up a little bit, but uh, hanging in there. You know, I did actually work out a little bit today. It took me a little while to walk to the fridge and get myself a nice cold one. I had an Arrogant Bastard Stone IPA. There you go. Um, they're not a sponsor, but they can be if they want to. So I did not do any jiu-jitsu today, but I'm um, glad, you know, your workout went well, and I'm excited to get into this podcast with you today. I have to say, I think you'll feel better in the morning, though, than I do. Probably. Anyway, a lot to do this week's episode, including results of the NLL expansion draft. We're going to talk about that a little bit today, and we also have an exclusive interview with Grayson Terrain and Johnny Serdic, um, two members of the PLL Chaos. So really looking forward to that interview. You guys will hear them a little bit later in the podcast. So Adam, why don't you start off with the fast break for us today? Yep, absolutely. We'll start in Major League Lacrosse on Thursday, 4th of July. The Denver Outlaws beat the Chesapeake Bayhawks 14-13. On Saturday, the Bayhawks got back at it with a victory over the Atlanta Blaze 16 to 13. On Sunday, the Boston Cannons beat the Denver Rattlers 15 to 11, and the Blaze bounced back for a victory over the New York Lizards 12 to 11. So we had a lot of close games in the MLL this week. On to the PLL, the Chrome t- took on the Chaos, and the Chrome finally got their first victory of the season with an emphatic victory. 19 to 11. The Whip Snakes got another victory in their rematch against the Atlas, 11 to 9. And in another battle against the Redwoods and the Archers, the Redwoods came out on top, 9 to 8, in overtime. All of the WPLL games this past weekend, unfortunately, were uh, rained out in Westchester, but will actually be played this coming Friday at Loyola University, and I'll actually be working those games, so I'm really excited about that. So check the website for some game recaps for the WPLL later in the week. So that's our fast break. Uh, Now we'll move along to our quick stick. The National Lacrosse League announced a contract extension for Commissioner Nick Sakevich. And then the first ever trade by the new Rochester Nighthawks was of Chris Wardle back to the Colorado Mammoth after drafting him in their expansion draft. In return for trading Wardle back to the Mammoth, they got Julian Garitano and Mike Mallory. They would then flip Mike Mallory by trading him to the Warriors and getting back a 2020 draft pick as well as Travis Burton. So that's our quick stick. Now let's discuss the all-star team rosters that were announced by the PLL and the MLL this week. For the PLL, it was announced that Matt Rambo and Trevor Baptiste would be the team captains. The format has been done before by other major leagues, and I, I quite frankly like it. Um, you know, it kind of gives a little bit of interest around the All-Star game rather than it just being based on region or division. And obviously, the PLL has neither of those things, so it was a no-brainer on their part. But for Team Rambo, on attack we have Connor Fields, Ryan Brown, Jordan Wolf, Miles Thompson, and Jules Henningberg. On the midfield, Jake Ficaro. Jake Bernhardt, Sergio Salcedo, Drew Snyder, Connor Busek, Mark Lassini, Joe Walters, and Sergio Perkovich. And then on defense, you have Matt Dunn, Bryce Young, Matt McMahon, and Michael Earhart and Brody Merrill at Long Stick Committee. For Fogo, for Team Rambo, you have Greg Grenlian, which is interesting because I don't know if he's fully recovered from his injury yet, but he will be in the All-Star game. And in goalie, we have Blaze Reardon and Kyle Bernlore. Then for Trevor Baptiste's team, he picked Will Manny, Ryan Drenner, Matt Cavanaugh, Marcus Holman, Justin Gutterding, and Josh Byrne on attack. At midfield, he had his teammate Paul Rabel, as well as Tom Schreiber, Mike Chanichuk, Miles Jones, Ned Crotty, Kyle Harrison, and Ty Warner. On defense, we have Tucker Durkin, Garrett Eppel, Matt Landis, and Jared Newman, while Kyle Hartzell and Scott Ratliff will round it out at long stick committee. You have Jack and Cannon and Tim Troutner in goal. And, of course, Trevor Baptiste will face off for his team. So those are your inaugural PLL All-Star rosters. 
Uh, we're excited to see the uniforms that will drop hopefully soon. Um, they are off this weekend, but they will be back in action on July 21st. As for the MLL, they also announced their rosters this week. For attack, we have Mark Cockerton, John Grant Jr., Colin Heacock, Shane Jackson, Dylan Malloy, Rob Pinnell, Randy Statz, Steele Stanwick, Lyle Thompson, and Bryce Wasserman. At midfield, Matt Abbott, Brendan Bomberry, Brian Cole, Kevin Crowley, Jack Curran, Zach Currier, Isaiah Davis Allen, Kyle Denoff, Brendan Cavanaugh, Nick Mariano, Mike Slosser, Brendan Sunday, TJ Camizio, and Zach Goodridge. At LSM, you have CJ Costaville and Ryland Reese. At defense, you have Jesse Bernhardt, Liam Burns, Jack Kerrigan, James Fahey, Justin Pugel, Jake Pulver, Finn Sullivan, and friend of the podcast, Ben Randall. At faceoff, you have Max Adler, Greg Pulskogian, Kevin Reisman, and Alex Woodall. And in net, you have Nico Amato, Chris Madelon, Nick Morocco, and Dylan Ward. Now, we haven't heard how the MLL is specifically going to separate these teams, but that's the 42 players that are going to represent the MLL in the 2019 All-Star Game. That'll take place at the Navy Marine Corps Memorial Stadium in Annapolis on July 27th. So that's a week after the PLL. So we'll still have some games coming up uh, for the MLL this weekend that we'll talk about a little bit later when we make our picks. But those are our rosters, Adam. Did you have anybody that you thought should have made the team, whether it's be on the PLL or the MLL? I don't know if there's anyone uh, in particular that may have gotten snubbed. I just the, the construction of the rosters are something that's super interesting to me. Obviously, it's really cool how the PLL did, did the player draft. And it'll be interesting to see how the MLL breaks things up, considering most past years um, it would be an exhibition game against Team USA um, a lot of the time. So it'll be interesting to see some fun concepts when it came to the player draft side of things. Both Rambo's goalies, uh, one was his college teammate, the other is his current roommate, um, which is kind of fun. And the other two goalies uh, are the two rookies on the other end, so it'll be interesting to see that battle. Obviously, the face-off battle is always an interesting one um, as well. So it'll, it, it should be a fun game. I'm really excited to see the gear that they um, drop. So it should, it should be a good game for, from the, the PLL side of things. And obviously, you can't go wrong with what the MLL is doing. They have a strong, strong rosters on their side, too. Just will be interesting to see how they break up the teams. Yeah, no, definitely. I got to say, the only one I really have a qualm with is Grenlian. Um, yeah. Not because he's injured either, but he, you know, he's fifth in faceoff percentage with 49% on the season, yeah. where Joe Nadella is sitting at a slightly higher than 57%. Second in the league. Had two goals this past weekend. We'll talk on that game a little bit later. Um, you know, I think he's a snub that he should have gotten in. Um, but, you know, obviously, Grenlian's the bigger name, known for the Faceoff Academy, a big personality. Makes sense that he probably got more fan votes. But uh, definitely would have been a guy I would have liked to see make it in. It, it, it makes sense. Like, like you said, it's the name. I don't know how many more seasons the Beast has in him. He came out of retirement just to play this year. So um, I, I think... That's kind of that's the D Wade nod, right? For for the All Star game, like D Wade made it this year, but maybe shouldn't have. Um, I, I'm okay with it if it's bringing out fans to LA. I'm all for it. Yeah, no, like you said with Dwayne Wade, and and last night we had the MLB All Star game, and you know CC Sabathia uh, was invited to that, where you know he he's up there in his career, and this is his last season, and um, he's another guy that you know you want to see at the All Star game because you want to see those big names, especially in their last chance to be in that big all-star game so it makes sense but I would have liked to see Nardella in it let's dive into some new rosters that were also released from the NLL um, we had our expansion draft yesterday as well and that was between the New York Riptide who are going to be based in Long Island playing at Nassau Coliseum and then you also had the new Rochester Nighthawks who are another expansion team the old Nighthawks went to Halifax to become the Thunderbirds so Rochester was awarded a new Nighthawks team um, same name Slightly different look as far as roster goes, but uh, let's talk about those rosters that were announced. You have for the New York Riptide, Jordan Durston, John Rannigan, Connor Kelly, Dan McRae, Jeff Cornwall, Kieran McArdle, Mike Manley, Dawson Thede, Tyler Digby, Alex Buke, and Jean-Luc Shetner. For the Rochester Nighthawks, you have first pick in the expansion draft, Sean Evans, Holden Katoni, Rylan Hartley, Shane Simpson, Curtis Knight, Dan Littner, Frank Brown, Matthew Bennett, Steve Fryer, 
and Brandon Goodwin. They also drafted Chris Warda, but as we mentioned, he was traded back to the Mammoth after the draft. So, Adam, tell me a little bit about the rosters and you know who kind of stands out to you. I know you talked about Curtis Knight being a guy that possibly could have been picked up. He's now on the Nighthawks. Um, Sean Evans returning to the Rochester Nighthawks where he started his career. So a few big names, you know, really jump off the board and um, make up the core group of these new teams. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited what, what both squads did in picking up some players. Obviously, I talked about it last week, you know, Sean Evans going back to Rochester, kind of uniting the fans, the old and the new. Um, good move by the new Rochester front office, uh, definitely. It's one thing that did surprise me, I think we talked a little bit about my expectations last week of maybe some players um, that teams wanted getting traded back to their, their old squads when, when they were left uh, free to be drafted. Um, didn't see as many like we, we discussed last week as I was expecting. So something, obviously we're still early on in the offseason for the NLL, so those things could continue to happen, and obviously we have the um, collegiate draft coming up as well. So it's it's expected that more more trades will be um, happening going forward. But I'm excited to see um, what some players can do, like John Rannigan and Connor Kelly, um, kind of going forward. So definitely had some names I was expecting to get drafted. A few that were a little bit surprising, but and when it comes to a draft like this, you don't know what the GMs and front offices of the of the different squads are looking to build, whether it's that um, young young talent like maybe the the wings went the route that route last year rather than bringing in as many veterans um, or you're, you're going for um, a veteran squad right away. So um, it'll be interesting to see what going forward what what these two rosters do to kind of continue to compile um, assets, whether that's through the draft or, or through free agency. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, and another guy that sticks out to me uh, is Kieran McArdle. He's having a very good season with the Atlas, and uh, he's going back to his hometown of Long Island um, to play for the New York Riptide. So yeah, definitely excited to watch these teams. Um, so now before we dive into the PLL games, Adam, um, the expansion draft got me thinking a little bit about what we could see from a future PLL expansion. So I don't want to give away too much, but I did come up with an article that is on our site now um, of four different concept teams that we could see added to the PLL in the future. You know, let us know what you think. We had a lot of fun with this. I uh, came up with some logos as well. And share us what you think some good expansion team names would be for the PLL in the future. But now that we're on the topic of the PLL, um, let's talk about this Archers-Redwoods game, Adam. The Archers cannot close out a game. They have lost four straight. Um, every game they've played so far has been decided or one or less, and this one was no exception. They lose to the Redwoods 9-8 in overtime um, in a rematch from Week 2. And, uh, you know, this time around they had Jules Henningberg on the offensive side. He's still undefeated, um, and the Redwoods keep rolling, you know. And the Archers got to figure it out. I, I don't know what it is. Um, again, you know, you actually they made a goalie change. Uh, you want to talk about, you know, how Drew Adams did in goal. He, he was sitting on his head. Um, you as a goalie know, like, sometimes a goalie can kind of change a team's makeup. Um, and I thought the defense actually played a lot better this week. They still had the usual suspects and Will Manny with two assists and two goals. And Marcus Holman also had two goals. Um, you know, Schreiber was disappointing. He only had one assist on the day. And, you know, you definitely need more from your star player in Tom Schreiber. But um, even at the faceoff X, Stephen Kelly, 94%. But I, I just don't know. I watched this game, and it's just the Archers are kind of complacent. You know, they'd have one good possession and then two bad ones. I mean, this game was a head-scratcher for me for the, the Archers. It looked like they were going to come away with a victory coming from behind and uh, tying it up late in the fourth. And, you know, again, it was very reminiscent of the Chaos game where they, you know, this time around they didn't really go off to too slow of a start. But, you know, the third quarter kind of got away from them, and they grinded back to make it, you know, a tie game, but again, fall to the Redwoods in overtime, an overtime that lasted just under eight minutes before we had Jules Henningberg get the game winner on a deflection, um, you know, so just some bad luck in this game. I think they, they really needed this victory um, to kind of, you know, right the ship, um, and, you know, I think they looked better than they did last week uh, against the Atlas, but, you know, they got to come out and they got to have a game like the Chrome just did and really dominate a team, I think, in order to you know put a run together. Because right now they're sitting at 2-4, and four, 
And, uh, you know, the, the playoffs are on the line. We only have four more games left in the season after the All-Star break. You know what that really stuck out to me was they had seven shot clock uh, violations in this one, and that, that just means their offense wasn't really clicking. And like you said, they, they had between that attack line, they had the shot opportunities. They just weren't uh, hitting cage as much as, as they were hoping. And Drew Adams killed it. I was Before the season, we talked, and I, I was surprised Drew Adams didn't get the nod at the beginning of the season. Gittleman's a fantastic goalie, but Drew Adams has been all world for the last couple of years, so um, he definitely sparked them. Um, there's something about the Redwoods this year. It just seems like they they just tend to pull these games out, and whether whether it's their coach Saint Laurent, um, they they like playing for him, and and that's something that we haven't discussed much this year was um, the types of teams that are successful and the types of coaches that are coaching those teams. Chaos, despite their loss this week seem to love Andy Towers. The Redwoods seem to back Nat St. Laurent so much. So it, it, I'm curious um, if, if there's a coaching side of this as well. Um, and, you know, that attack line um, really outproduced uh, the Archers attack line for the Redwoods. Uh, Ryder Garnsey getting on the board this year. The, the most uh, questionable thing that was done by the Redwoods all season was if you saw the Instagram video, uh, Ryder signing a kid's head with a sharpie on his forehead. So I, I'm wondering how long that's going to take off, to get off that poor kid's forehead, but he seemed excited. So it'll be interesting to see where we go from here, you know. Um, it's a perfect point in the season for it to be the all-star break when we have a couple teams at the top and then everyone else. So uh, it'll be it, it's exciting to see what happens going forward. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, the Redwoods have been extremely fun to watch, and just how they've been able to plug in each of those attackmen that you mentioned, you know. I mean, yeah. when Joey Sankey went down, it was like, okay, well, there was a guy who was, you know, having some great a great two games, um, and, you know, they, they got Jules Henningberg in the trade. He came in and performed for them. Ryder Garnsey, obviously, like you said, is doing well as well, um, you know, teaming up with a fellow Notre Dame guy in Kavanaugh. Um, yeah, so definitely, and I, I like what you said about the coaching, because I would throw Jim Stagnita in that group. You know, he has the whip stakes playing at a high level, and they're at the top of the standings. So definitely, definitely a valid point there. I mentioned Jim Stagnita. Tell me a little bit about this whip stakes game. They beat the Atlas. That's a sweep for them in the season. Um, but it was another close one that, you know, almost saw the Atlas coming out on top again. Yeah, no, it was, it was a great game. Got pushed back because of weather. We haven't brought that up, but that torrential downpours was pushed back over an hour. Um, Whip Snakes came out pretty quick despite the um, Atlas scoring the first few um, after the first quarter was 7-3. Just like game one, the Atlas kind of bounced back after halftime despite being down a, cu- a bunch of goals going into halftime. Bounced back in that third quarter um, behind three straight goals from Ryan Brown, Connor Busick, and Paul Rabel. Um, they came out to play again, and that this seems like if there is a rivalry, uh, this is the biggest one so far, whether, whether it's the... I don't even think it matters that it's the Maryland uh, Hopkins thing. I think that that obviously is something to play off of, but they these two teams seem to not like each other very much and 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 it shows on the field um Going into the fourth quarter, it was 9-7, and they had an even fourth quarter, both scoring two goals, but um, there were a couple chances for for the Atlas to to get a couple two-point shots off and get a couple shots off late to to tie it, but it it just was for not. So um, definitely an interesting game, Um, definitely a fun one. Uh, Whip Snakes were able to pull this one out, though, um, to to get another one over the Atlas, and uh, this was a big one, I think, going forward for the Atlas when it comes to playoff standings. Obviously, every loss counts, um, but they're pretty deep in the standings when it comes to goal differential, and that actually is playing uh, the fir- one of the first things that they go to um, when they do have uh, even records. So they could be on the outside looking in just based off of goal differential when the regular season ends. So. Um, they might have to pull a few um, big victories out going forward to make sure um, they get into the playoffs. Yeah, no, because you, you mentioned that goal differential. Uh, it's helping the now 1-5 Chrome, who had the biggest blowout in PLL history, uh, 1911, against the Chaos, who um, narrowly beat them last week. There's so much to talk about in this game. It seemed like a statement win for the Chrome. I mean, they needed a big win badly. They needed any win badly, but... They couldn't have asked for a better win in this one. Um, they had Jordan Wolf had 
four goals and two assists for six points. Then Jordan McIntosh had five goals, two assists on this game for seven points. He was one shy of Jules Henningberg's record, and he scored from all over the field. He scored on a crease dive, a step-down shot, a little give-and-go, a sidearm rip right in front of the crease, and then a behind-the-back goal, which might have been the best one of the day. Um, and we were going back and forth a little bit with Time and Room podcast, who suggested that this could be lacrosse's version of the cycle, and I have to agree with them. Um, so hats off to Jordan McIntosh. Possibly another all-star snub there, but he had a day. And, you know, I don't want to take anything away from the Chrome. Um, they got some good goalie play out of both Queener before he was injured and then uh, Galloway coming in after Queener's injury, and we hope Queener, you know, has a speedy recovery. But I really think the chaos were missing Troy Ray and Miles Thompson. Um, you know, Troy Ray at the LSM and Miles Thompson on attack were both missing for the chaos in this game, and I think it showed. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, we talked about that chaotic nature of them being such a success for them going forward um, and in previous weeks. That kind of hurt, nipped them in the butt this week, you know, and um, definitely a big statement win for the Chrome, and, and they are one game out of playoff contention. As crazy as that sounds, at 1-5, and five, um, John Galloway had never been pulled in a game before last week in his entire lacrosse career. And for him to come back, and, and despite only being at 50% saves, he made some big ones late. Um, even though they were up, those saves mattered. And it was big for him to bounce back after being pulled. Whether it's going in because of injury or going in because they just need you, it was big for him to come up with some saves late. Yeah, no, I think it was a, a, the best type of game for him to get his confidence back. You know, he came in with a, a little bit of a lead, and, um, you know, the offense kind of, you know, put the game into overdrive, and he was able to, you know, to make some clutch saves uh, without a lot of that pressure, um, you know, of being in do-or-die mode. So, yeah, I think it was a good game to get his confidence back, and, you know, I, I, I think they'll probably end up going back with him after the All-Star break. We'll see what Coach Starza decides to do in net, but, you know, I'll tell you one thing that he won't be doing this week, and that's mowing his lawn. And I am one to admit my mistakes. I told you two weeks ago that picking the chrome over the chaos was crazy. I again laughed in your face. I think you're a fool for doing that. I think we're going to see Coach Starza uh, mow the lawn a little bit more. I think you're a fool for doing that. Fool for doing that. I just need to issue Coach Starza an apology. Um, you do not have to mow your lawn, Coach Starza, this week. So I will graciously mow your lawn for you. Um, congrats on your first victory. Go big or go chrome. Cromer here, um, you know, it took, them, it took them six weeks to get here, but they're here now, and I think they're going to really shake things up following the All-Star break. So some great games this past weekend. Uh, we'll miss the PLL this weekend, uh, but looking forward to that All-Star game in two weeks. So before we wrap up, Saturday was, in fact, Military Appreciation Day for the PLL. They had some veterans in attendance, um, former Army lacrosse players Captain Ben Harrow, Major Eric Minio in attendance, as well as former Army non-commissioned officer and Redwoods coach, Nat St. Laurent um, on the sidelines. So what better way for us to honor the military than having two members of the military and two members of the chaos, Grayson Terrain and Johnny Serdic. So let's take a listen to my conversation with Grayson and Johnny. I'm here with Grayson Terrain and Johnny Serdic, both members of the PLL chaos. Johnny is a defenseman and Grayson is a midfielder and both were drafted in the 2019 PLL draft. Grayson and Johnny are no strangers to each other. The two faced off against each other for four years in one of the most historic rivalries in lacrosse. With Johnny attending the U.S. Military Academy in West Point and Grayson attending the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. And prior to their college careers, both played with each other at DeMatha Catholic High School. Grayson and Johnny, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you guys for joining again. Um, as an Army officer myself, it's great to be talking to a Navy officer and an Army officer on this podcast, especially coming off the July 4th weekend. Um, so just thank you, though, for all you guys do on the field as well as off the field as well. So to get started, I just want to ask, uh, when did you guys first get started in lacrosse, and what was it like playing with each other at DeMatha Catholic? So the first time, you know, we played we played lacrosse was third, I want to say it was third grade in, uh, at Gork, which is in, in Gambrel's, uh, in Gambrel's, Maryland. Um, we played football together, and then uh, he said that he was playing lacrosse, and a bunch of other guys that were playing on my football team were playing on uh, were playing lacrosse in the, in the spring. So I decided to, to join them and see what it was about. Yeah, we uh we all played football together, and we had a uh, mutual friend. His dad played lacrosse at Maryland back in the day, and uh, 
he he's been he was playing for a while and and coaching his son Logan. So uh, Logan got all of us together and uh, got us all out on the lacrosse field. That's great. And uh, you know, when did you guys then decide to pursue a military career and go to a separate service academies? And when did it really dawn on you that you guys were going to face each other? You know, for the next four years. Um, you know, right after we we committed, I mean, I thought that was one of my first thoughts. You know me playing at uh, the the Naval Academy and him playing at the, uh, uh, at Army. I knew we were going to, you know, square up for the, for the next four years. And even at NAPS, you know, that the year right before we went to the Academy too, mm-hmm. got a, got a chance to play against each other. Yeah, so what really influenced your decisions to uh, go to a service Academy and join the military, um, you know, and pursue that as well as pursue a career in lacrosse? We'll start with you, Grayson. Um, well, I think it was, you know, going to uh, DeMatha, there's, we had a ton of guys that, had gone to the Naval Academy and, um, and, you know, being from Maryland, you know, you're always down in, in downtown Annapolis and uh, you see those guys and you see how they act. And, you know, that was kind of one of those reasons that I, I really looked up to, you know, the guys that had gone through to Matha and on to the Naval Academy. Um, you know, the guys obviously like Brendan Looney, who was, you know, a Navy lacrosse guy, also a DeMatha lacrosse guy, DeMatha football. Uh, those mm-hmm. guys you just look up to and make you want to decide to go there. Yeah, same kind of thing. Um, being around DeMatha, being influenced by the guys like Brendan Looney, who you hear so much about his legacy and the effect he has, his name has on people. Um, and then growing up, uh, both of us uh, lived around Fort Meade. I know both of us, we had a football coach who uh, was stationed at Fort Meade, real high energy guy, like to have him around. And then, uh, just a couple other family friends I had grown up who were in the military. So it was definitely something that interested me. Um, for me, actually, Navy never really recruited me. So I uh, made the trip up to Army and decided I wanted to go that route. You guys mentioned Brendan Looney, um, who was you know, a Navy SEAL, uh, who, who played lacrosse at Navy, tragically was killed in action in 2010. At Navy, they have the number 40 always worn by a special member who is voted on. And, Johnny, you actually chose to wear the number 40 uh, your senior year. What was that like, representing a guy who was so influential in both the military and lacrosse community? Uh, it, it was it was extremely humbling, um, just kind of reflecting back on, like you said, the influences we had uh, to go the service, service academy route. I didn't think there could be a better way. Uh, to honor Brennan and his family than to represent him wearing the number 40. Um, it was just extremely humbling, you know, makes you think about everything. that It's bigger than lacrosse. And I just, you know, I felt like it was a good thing to do. No, definitely a, a nice gesture on your part um, and one that hasn't been overlooked. Um, so you guys were a part of some really great games uh, in the Army-Navy rivalry. Um, you know, your first year playing each other, Navy won 11-10, and then another close one, 9-8. It wasn't until you guys' senior year, uh, Johnny, when you guys finally got over the, the hump and beat them 9-8 in overtime this past season. Uh, Johnny, tell me what it was like to get that first win, you know, in the 100th meeting of these service academies in lacrosse. Uh, it was awesome. Um, like you said, Navy had the first first three victories on us. Um, so... Being able to get that that win my final final year senior year was it meant so much to me um, and especially getting it down at the Naval Academy uh, so close to uh, where I grew up um, it was just awesome. And I know Grayson, it probably had to be a little uh, bitter for you, you know, going out on the losing end, but you were part of a big turnaround um, at the Naval Academy program and it seen some rough patches before you arrived. So tell me a little bit what it was like to, you know, uh, be part of that Navy turnaround. It was it was awesome. I mean, I think that's like one of those things that everyone wants to be able to do as a you know, as a player coming in uh, as a freshman, and you know, your 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 whole class would like to, you know, especially if your team wasn't, you know, the best. Um, you'd like to turn a program around and, and get them on the right track, and you know, I think I think we we did that, and I think. Going forward, I think we have a lot of really young, young, good guys that are that are going to keep uh, the program going in that direction. But it means it means everything, you know, for for the legacy of our seniors, for you know, guys who graduated now that we were able to, you know, you know, help those guys get on the right foot. You know, definitely. Um, and so my father actually played at the Naval Academy in the late '80s, 
Um, so I, I grew up around the rivalry. I kind of, you know, understand its importance. Um, and now being an Army guy myself, me and my dad, you know, kind of chirp back and forth a little bit every year when the game comes around. Um, but it's a very respectful rivalry. I mean, I can't think of another rivalry where the teams will stand together for the opposing team's alma mater being sung. Um, you know, so it's, it really is a testament to the type of leaders that you guys are going through these service academies. Um, but I have to ask, was there any trash talk, you know, thrown each other's way uh, during these four years? Um, not not really, at least not from my side. You know, Johnny will come up and, you know, say something every once in a while, we'll, we'll chirp, but nothing, you know, nothing mean-hearted. That's just, you know, kind of who we are. We don't we don't talk too much, at least I don't. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, you guys played in high school together, but against each other in college. Did you guys ever think you would be drafted by the same professional lacrosse league? And did you even think professional lacrosse was a possibility, given that you guys are active duty in the military? Um, I did not. That was that was not in my in my thought process. You know, going going to the academy like when I was a, when I was a freshman. But you know, as it goes on, and you see guys that you know are a year ahead of you or two years ahead of you playing. Uh, playing in the, at the next level, you know, I started to figure out like maybe maybe I could do this, and this would be a you know a good way to spend spend my summer before you know going off to to training and you know finally hanging up the the, the cleats. You know, like he said, at at first you don't know how it'll work out. Um, you know, with our assignments, where we're going, um, how our chain of command will will take it and everything. So. Um, you, you're not really sure how it'll work out, mm-hmm. but as, as far as being drafted by the same team, I I remember watching the draft and I'm just waiting for his name to be called. And when the chaos selected him again, I was so relieved because now I don't have to cover him again. He's not my <laughs> anymore. He's back on my team. <laughs> That's great. And how has the PLL really accommodated your guys' military commitments? You both have training coming up. So how's it, you know, the PLL accommodated that, and um, how's you know Coach Towers been um, respectful of your guys' bigger commitments? Coach has been, Coach Towers has been, you know, awesome, allowing us to do, you know, I think he really understands that, you know, there's certain things that we we have to do within, you know, within the military as far as training is concerned, and and he's been, you know, super respectful and uh, and great about letting us do those things and. And I can't talk, you know, and I can't say anything, you know, better about uh, Coach Towers because he's an absolute, he's absolutely the man. Yeah, he's uh, he's been great about it, uh, whether it's, you know, away for a game or uh, having to miss training camp um, for graduation and stuff. Um, but for me, my situation, I'm actually my first assignment is a – grad assistant up at uh, West Point with the lacrosse team for uh, this first semester um, and throughout the summer. So it's been it's been pretty easy for me to go ahead and play every weekend mm-hmm. because I have uh, Coach Alvarisi, uh pretty much directly in charge of me. So he's he's allowed me to leave uh, and travel with the with the chaos whenever whenever I need to. So it's a, a pretty good situation for this this first season. But uh Hopefully it'll it'll continue to work out. So, where are you guys' assignments um, in branches in the military? So, uh, I'm going to be a Marine aviator. I branched field artillery and uh, posted to Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. Okay, so we got field artillery and uh, Grayson. Are you going to be down in Pensacola for flight school? Yeah, so I'll I'll start off in Quantico, Virginia, and then from there I'll go to you know, Pensacola, Florida for flight school. Awesome. I just had a buddy who was uh, down there for flight school. You know, but that that's great. Um, and I think this is a good time to segue into our five and five segment. So I'm going to ask you guys five questions about lacrosse and then five questions about life in general. So uh, Grayson, we'll have you go first, and Johnny, you can follow up with your answer. Okay. So first question, what are some uh, superstitions or pregame rituals that you have? Probably my, my really only pregame, you know, superstition or whatever would be, you know, just retaping my stick every uh, every every uh, before every game. That's pretty much it. For me, uh, I always have to put my left sock on first, and then back at Army before every game. Uh, one of our attackmen, Nate Jones, and I would switch game shorts before every game. Oh, that's that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> What's your current stick setup? Well, you know, what shaft do you use? Do you string your head a certain way? 
I'm not a huge like stick guy, so uh, let me think if I even know what it is. Right <laughs> um, I actually just got. I think it's a hyper like a warrior hyperlight shaft from uh, yeah, you have a Jack Rowlett, <laughs> who <laughs> actually who actually let me borrow his his shaft for the for for the summer. To be honest with you, don't know what head I'm using. Really don't. Nah, that's about that's about it. And I have usually have uh, Tommy Miller, who's a who's a pole at the at the academy, string my sticks. So. Uh, I have both the hammer head and the hammer shaft, uh, and I cannot string either. So uh, <laughs> I have my friend Tommy Marino string my sticks up for me. Yeah, I never was good at uh, stringing my own stick either. I always tried my hand at it, but would usually have a teammate end up doing it, so I understand. All right, third question. Which of your Chaos teammates do you guys find the funniest? Cool. Um that's a that's a tough one. There's a lot of funny guys on our team. I think that's an easy one. I think if I had to put number one would probably be, probably be Blaze Riordan, our goalie, Blaze Under. Mm-hmm. He's he's a he's a funny guy. Yeah, Blaze all the way. He's he's actually hilarious. That's awesome. Yeah, we actually got to talk to Blaze uh, after the game in Baltimore. You know, we just asked him some questions about the game, but we'll definitely have to have him on the podcast at some point. Now that brings me to my fourth question. Who's someone in the lacrosse community that you guys admire, whether it's a coach, a uh, teammate, or even an opponent? I would say Kyle Harrison. Uh, he was kind of one of those guys that I was that that I first watched when I was watching lacrosse. You know, someone that you know looked like me that was able to play a certain way, and I would really enjoy watching him play. And is definitely a mentor you know, to me. Ooh, um, I would have to throw it back to when I was a freshman. Uh, one of the defensemen we had in Army, Reese Klipstein. I, I looked up to him a lot. He took me in and mentored me as a as a freshman, and he's a big part of who I am as a lacrosse player today. That's great. So last lacrosse question, what is your top song on your current game day or workout playlist? Definitely, you know, changes throughout, you know, throughout the weeks and as mm-hmm. new songs come out, but I think it might be, I think it's Money in the Graves by Drake and Rick Roth just actually came out. It's a pretty good song, so that's where, that's where it is right now. Uh yeah, same thing changes a little bit, but I think right now, uh, homicide by uh, Logic and Eminem. Now we can go from our lacrosse related questions to our non lacrosse related questions. So the first one will be, what was one of the hardest things that you guys had to do during your plebe year? Ooh, um, I think the hardest the hardest things that we have to do more involved you know lacrosse workouts than than anything you know going from lacrosse workouts to to homework to workouts in the morning with your companies, whatever it was, just, you know, I guess balancing all these different things as a plebe. Yeah, I actually have the same exact answer. Uh, between balancing all the military, academic, and athletic stuff, we we have the athletes at the academies have so much less time to get the same amount of stuff done as, as everyone else. And adjusting to that as a 18, 19, 20-year-old going into a service academy is, is very challenging. You know, that kind of segues into my second question. Um, how has being in the military helped you in your lacrosse career and in other aspects of life? Uh, I think, you know, discipline. Discipline is one of those is one of, think, one of those things that, you know, everyone's got to say, especially from being at a service academy. Um, just being disciplined, you know, practice a certain way, you know, go after ground balls a certain way, do, do everything a certain way. It's just all about discipline. And uh, I think that's what's really stuck with me and will stick with me, you know, through my career and lacrosse and as well as uh, the military. I'd say, I'd say toughness, uh, give so much stuff thrown at you. You got to be able to uh, stay poised and handle everything. It's the same way on the lacrosse field. Um, just kind of analyzing and, you know, going down getting that two handed ground ball, taking the hit and just kind of being all around, all around tough. You yeah, know, I, I think you're, you're on point with those answers because military, you have to keep a level head, you know, especially in the combat situation. Um, and you know, that translates really well to the lacrosse field as well. So, um, yeah, great answers on that one. So our third one, what is your favorite meal and do you guys prefer to dine in, take out, or cook at home? I probably prefer to dine out uh, the, mo- the most. And my favorite meal has just got to be a really, really nice steak from, you know, a good steakhouse. Pretty simple, simple and easy. I will take anything my mom cooks any day of the week, but favorite pregame meal is uh, a chicken parm. We had it. We had it for every pregame meal uh, at Army ever since I was a freshman. Grayson, do you have a particular steakhouse you, you like the most? 
there's a steakhouse in uh, downtown Naples called Loons, and it's to this day the best steak that I've ever had. So. Oh, good to know. I'll have to check it out if I'm ever back in the Annapolis area. All right, so our fourth question, what are some hobbies or activities you guys enjoy doing when you're not playing lacrosse? I enjoy watching movies. That's probably one of my one of my favorite things to do is just sit down and relax and watch and watch a, a new movie that, that just came out, something like that. Um, with the lack of freedoms we've had at the academies, um, I'd say other than lacrosse, I'd play video games. Do you play anything in particular? Are you a more first person shooter or you know a sports gamer? Say first person shooter. Yeah, so now our, our our final question is my favorite one to come up with. <laughs> What is your least favorite military acronym or saying? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Johnny take one. I gotta I gotta think of one. There's so many. <laughs> All right, I got I got one. Um, Go ahead, G. Yeah, <laughs> at the academy, there's one. People always say uh, it stands for it's Navy and it stands for you know never actively volunteer yourself. A lot of people don't like to to <laughs> volunteer themselves themselves for things and. Um, I just think that one's a little bit, hmm. it's not the greatest, uh, greatest thing. So I probably can do away with that one. Uh, I guess if you say like, are you tracking this or whatever? Like if you're aware of something, I don't know. It's just like, are you tracking? Yeah, no, I, I agree. That does get old um, pretty quickly. Yeah, m- mine has to be uh, hurry up and wait for me. That's always a funny one because, you know, a lot of times we're told to be at this time and get there early and then you end up waiting um a lot longer than you anticipated um so hurry up and wait would probably be my least favorite saying that the army tends to use a lot so that concludes our five and five um before i let you guys go i have one more question uh, what is some advice you all, what is some advice you would have for you know a young athlete who's looking to pursue a, a career in lacrosse as well as a career in the military um just you know just keep working hard i mean i think it's you know, it's the same thing for you know for every kid. You just work hard and you try and get better every day. Um, you'll you'll make it there. Have you know good mentors to to help you um, get better and 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 you'll and you'll get there. Uh, just keep keep working. Yeah, I'd say just just love to play the game. You know whether that's loving to go out back and hit the wall for thirty minutes or loving to go to practice with your friends or just throw around out back. Uh, the more you love it, you just enjoy doing it, and and you'll just the better you'll get. No, that's some great advice. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, it was really special for me. I, I really love what you guys are doing, both on the field as well as off. Um, so best of luck in your military careers, and best of luck this season with the chaos as well. All right, thank you. Thank you for having us too. Yeah, thanks for having us. So now we're going to get into our MLL games. Um, the first one I want to discuss is our 4th of July game, the Bayhawks-Outlaws game. And I actually said last week that this was my most anticipated matchup just because of the attack lines on both teams, and it did not disappoint. Um, it may have taken more than four hours and three lightning delays, but the Denver Outlaws and Chesapeake Bayhawks delivered on the fireworks last past 4th of July, um, and it was yeah. the thriller that all the fans hoped for. Lyle Thompson, five goals, one assist. Steel Stanwick had two goals, two assists. For the Bayhawks team that you know got production from really all over the field, but it was the Outlaws attacking Chris Aslanian, Zach Courier, and John Grant Jr. that helped Denver secure its fourth straight victory and a five and one record at the top of the standings in the MLL. This game was tight until the end, Adam. I mean, if it wasn't for the stops, we'd have had a real thriller from start to finish. Um, unfortunately, you know the weather did cause a little bit of sluggishness in the middle of the game, um, but you know they went back and forth until the fourth quarter when the Bayhawks looked like they were just going to pull away. They went up four goals, but the Outlaws showed they weren't done. Um, they went on a five-goal run, thanks in large part to Max Adler at the faceoff X. He had a phenomenal day, and he's now a 2019 MLL All-Star, a former uh, Division II guy. Um, but I, I would be wrong to not mention that this game could have actually gone to overtime. Lyle Thompson had six points on the day, almost had his seventh if it wasn't for a beautiful crease dive goal that was waved off by the referees. And unfortunately, the Bayhawks had already used their coach's challenge, so they could not challenge this. Upon looking at the replay, it was clear that the ball broke the plane of the net before he landed in the crease. Um, so a tough one for the Bayhawks to lose. They would drop the 2-2 two and two before getting their third victory on the season later in the weekend. But just a phenomenal game all around. Um, again, 
some great production from the Outlaws attack. Chris Aslanian had two goals, three assists. Zach Courier had four goals and an assist. And John Grant Jr., again, two goals and an assist. He's shown no signs of stopping anytime soon. So Outlaws are sitting at 5-1 and one at the top, and they look like the team to beat right now. Yeah, definitely. Despite it being sloppy, I love these kinds of games. You know, These are the kinds of games when you're in high school, youth league, it's torrential downpour, it's raining, but you play through it, and these are the types of games you remember. And not only are the games remembered uh, by the players, but the fans will remember this one for being a great one. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, like I said, it was just a disappointing one for the Bayhawks. Uh, they can hold their heads high, though, because they would get a victory this weekend um, on Saturday when they took on the Blaze um, in a game that was also really back and forth uh, throughout. Bayhawks end up winning 16-13 to in a revenge match from last week. Lyle Thompson, eight points. I mean, he's just putting up six, seven, eight-point games like they're nothing. Um, and I know his coach called him the best player in the world. And, you know, honestly, I have to agree. You throw this guy in the PLL, I still think he's scoring eight points a game. He's kind of the guy that gets the gears going. You know, he can feed, he can score. Um, he does all the things we saw him do at Albany those four years. So um, a great game for him. Uh, and, you know, Chesapeake gets above 500 at 3-2 and two, um, in a critical victory against the Blaze. And you know what I always think of in terms of just the players that are on both squads? It, it Take Lyle Thompson off the Bayhawks. They have talent, but they're not as successful, I don't think. The Atlanta Blaze, however, despite the loss, I think they have a more well-rounded offense. So it'll be interesting to see how they bounce back from this one. Bayhawks are super competitive still. Two of the best teams in the MLL this year so far. Um, it'll be interesting to see um, when they meet up again, inevitably, um, later on in the season, how things go. Yeah, no, and we'd be remiss to uh, not mention the scrum that got fighting again talked about in the lacrosse community. So we had some pushing and some shoving, and then it was Randy Stotts and Warren Jeffrey who actually dropped gloves and started punching each other, got in a full-on fist fight, NLL style, and they were both ejected from the game and eventually suspended one game. Um, and the Bayhawks even had Warren Jeffrey issue a video apology on social media um, to the fans. And I, don't want, I didn't want to bring it up right away because, again, I don't want it overshadowing another phenomenal game. But this was the way to handle fighting in professional lacrosse. I get that it's part of the NLL. I get that both these guys are in the NLL and grew up in the box game, but is not part of the MLL's rules, is not traditionally part of the field lacrosse, and I think the MLL handled it the right way by ejecting these guys and giving them a one-game suspension. Not good for the sport, not good for the fans. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Everyone knows my opinion on it by now. Um, and some people took issue with the Bayhawks having Warren Jeffrey Apologize. I thought that was taking it a little too far. Um, you know, I think a public statement would have been just fine. I don't see anything wrong with having him issue an apology. It just shows that he is sorry for what he did and that the MLL is not going to tolerate this. Um, so kudos to them for how it was handled. And, you know, that just kind of showed you, you know, the intensity of the game that it boiled down to that point. But it was nice that these teams were able to set that aside and get, at, get back to playing lacrosse um, in another close one. Not having Stotts was a big loss, but it kind of led to the emergence of Brendan Sunday, who had a hat trick on the day, um, as well as two assists. So he went off. Um, he also was named to the All Star game, um, having a pretty good rookie year, uh, and he would be influential in the Blazes' second game of the weekend against the Lizards. But we all picked against the Blaze just because of the short rest, and they came out and they uh, they won a close one against the Lizards. The Lizards. Were able to bounce back last week, and it just it just didn't click for them this week. So uh, I didn't think they were this bad, but it, it it's it's tough to to say they're not at this point. I know they have some strong talent, like like we've discussed in previous weeks, but it's just not clicking. And the Rattlers are defeated; they don't have any wins, and the Lizards are right in front of them, not too far off. And despite the Rattlers having some younger talent, um, the Lizards seem like they should be doing better than they are and it, it's just not working and I think we should have thought twice about picking against the Blaze despite the short short rest um, that was kind of a silly pick probably at this point I don't want to take away too much from the Lizards it was tied after every quarter going into the fourth and then even in the fourth tied to the very end until Shane Jackson with no time left on the shot clock 
and less than a minute left in the game uh, would put the Blaze ahead um, for a really tough loss for the Lizards. I mean, if they would have gotten that, they would have been sitting at two and four, uh, you know, with a chance to kind of make it interesting later in the season. But they dropped to one and five, um, despite you know solid production from their big guys in Rob Pinnell, who had two goals and an assist, and Dylan Malloy with a goal and three assists. But they just couldn't get it done. And I think Adam, you might have been right about you know the four playoff teams already coming into shape, um, unless. One of these teams, the Rathers or the Lizards, can really turn it around um, at the second half of the season. Yeah, they. I, I mean, the Lizards are already at least three games out of playoff contention at this point, and um, they obviously the league's small enough where if you keep winning, the the standings will get a little bit closer. But um, I we haven't seen it yet from them, and they they have a lot of games to play left, you know. Um, but it's it doesn't look like. It's been clicking. I know this was a really strong competition. May have been the best game they've played all year. Um, obviously, last week they played the Rattlers, so I don't think they played their best. Um, it just doesn't seem like it, it's their season, and they have tons of games left against all of the teams that are playoff bound right now. Um, but unless they win the next couple, I, I just don't see it. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think I don't think they're playing inspired lacrosse right now. You gotta you gotta win when the team you're playing is playing on you know, less than twenty four hour rest, um, and is missing one of their leading scorers in Randy Stotts. So good opportunity for the Lizards to steal one here, and they couldn't get it done. So they're looking like they might be on the outside looking in when the season ends. Yeah, I, w- I will say I, I think the biggest point of their season is coming up. Maybe not next week against the Cannons, but after that they play three straight games against the BayHawks who are three games ahead of them currently in the standing. So they play once before the All-Star break, and then the first two games, back-to-back days, mind you, um, against the Bayhawks um, after the All-Star break the first week of August. If they win those three games, they're right back in it. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, you know, two of the oldest teams in the league, um, and a regional rivals, uh, definitely going at it. And the, the last game was close. You know, the Lizards lost 16-14. to Um Definitely not out of the realm of possibility, but um, I'll believe it when I see it. Yep. Well, that brings us to our game picks of the week. Um, Adam, you are now ten and eleven, so it's just a little bit below five hundred. Um, I'm twelve and nine, so you you made up some ground. Uh, the Chrome definitely helped you. Our boy Tim, who was on uh, last week, he's four and three, so pretty good job there, Tim. Um, we'll have him on later this season for sure. Um, but let's. Dive in in the MLL game since there are no PLL games this weekend. Who you got in the MLL for the Cannons and the Lizards? I think based off all our previous discussions, the the Cannons are clicking on all cylinders. Mark Cockerton is arguably one of the best players in the league uh, yet again after last season kept up, and I'm going with the Cannons in this one. Yeah, I'm going to take the Cannons as well. Um, like I said, I'll believe it when I see it, when the Lizards turn it around. But, um, you know, I, I'm expecting another close one between these two teams. Um, but the Cannons, they just have too much offensive firepower, whether it's Kyle Jackson or Mark Cockerton. And then they got all-star Nick Morocco in net. So um, I think that they'll come out on top in this one as well. So then, on the, so then that same day we have the Blaze taking on the Outlaws. This might be the game to watch this week. Um, so, Adam, who are you picking in this one? Yeah, this was this is a tough one. I'm I'm really excited to watch this one um, on Thursday. It should be a good one. I'm going with the Blaze in this one. Despite them going one and one last week, I think they have the best attack line um, in the whole MLL. I know we've discussed previously that a lot of us um, really like the the BayHawks attack line, um, but they've been the most dominant all season. Um, and I'm going with the Blaze in this one. I'm gonna go Outlaws. You know, the Outlaws are at home. They historically play well at home. Um, and I, I think their attack line is going to edge out the blaze. Uh, you know, you got John Grant Jr. who can feed, he can shoot at his age still. I mean, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse talking about him every week because he's just, he's still playing at a high level. Um, and then you got Courier and Kavanaugh also adding a change of pace as well as Aslanian who had a big game last week. Um, and, and they also have Max Adler at the faceoff X. Um, so that'll be a fun matchup to watch him take on Alex Woodall um, this week. And uh, I'm going to go with the Outlaws in this one. So then for our next game this weekend, we have 
So then for our only Saturday game, then for our only Saturday game this weekend, we have the Cannons taking on the Blaze in Atlanta at in Atlanta at 8 p.m. It's a night game. Adam, who are you picking in this one? I'm I'm sticking with the Blaze in this one. I know um, they play really well at home so far this season. Um, the fans have been coming out in droves uh, for the ATL, so I'm picking the Blaze. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take Hot Atlanta as well. Um, I think they're gonna. I think they've shown that they they can really hang with anybody, and the Cannons are a good team. But I think the Blazers are gonna give them a little bit of a change of pace that the Cannons haven't seen recently. You know, the Cannons played uh, the Rathers last week. They'll be playing the Lizards on Thursday. Um, not the greatest competition to get ready for a good team in the Blaze. So I'm gonna take the Blaze as well. Then our final game of the weekend. Sunday is the Bayhawks versus the Rattlers. Adam, do I even have to ask, who are you picking in this one? I don't think it's going to be a close one. It has in the past, but I, I just don't see this being the game that the Rattlers pull out for their first victory. Yeah, no, I, I think the Rattlers, you know, they, they make these games as tight as they can be, but, you know, I got to go with the Bayhawks. Lyle Thompson, probably easier to predict him having another eight points than it is to not. Um and you know, I it's scary, but the the Rattlers could could easily, you know, go winless this season. Um, I think they'll get one when they when they play the Lizards again. Um, that was another close one that they barely lost. Um, and who knows that there might be an upset on their horizon. But this team isn't going anywhere, um, unfortunately. And uh, I think it's going to be the BayHawks all day on Sunday. Yeah, and if you just, I mean. Even looking at the, the All-Stars from both squads, Rattlers had the smallest amount in three. Bayhawks had the biggest in ten All-Stars. So from an outsider looking in, I think they would just looking at the rosters, they'd pick the Bayhawks ten out of ten times. Yeah, no, definitely uh, agree with you on that one. Um, well, let's go to our WPLL games. We already picked these games. Um, so we're going to stay with our picks. Adam picked the Brave and the Fire, while I picked the Command and the Pride. Those games will be on Friday. At Loyola, Adam will be there. He'll be bringing you some coverage from those games. Um, We're excited to get out there. Uh, It's unfortunate that the weather wasn't the best in Westchester, but ends up working out for us better. So that wraps up our podcast. Uh, Another great week of lacrosse. Um, It's you know it's a really great time to be a fan of lacrosse right now. Be sure to follow us on social media and check out our website. We have our new five and five segment in article form uh, with Ben Randall. We sat down with Ben Randall to discuss. Um, you know, just life on the lacrosse field as well as off of it. He was just named the All-Star Game for the New York Lizards. Um, so really great talking to him um, and getting a little bit of insight of what it's like being a professional lacrosse player. Um, also be sure to follow us on either Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, um, any major podcast out there. Leave us a review, subscribe. And, you know, we just uh, we enjoy engaging with you guys on social media. I think the lacrosse community is Um, is great, and it's an exciting time to be a pro lacrosse fan. Um, And that brings us to our overtime. Adam, what are you looking forward to most this weekend? You know what? I'm super excited to get down to Loyola and watch the the women's league uh, make up these two games. I'm really excited to to be on the field there. I'm actually uh, going to be working the games um, for the PLL, so I'll actually be working the games for the WPLL. So I'm really excited to get out there and see some live action in person again. And, you know, I have to say I'm probably most excited about this Blaze Outlaws game. Um, I think we're going to get another great one, kind of like the Outlaws-Bayhawks game of this past week. Um, and I just want to see, you know, John Grant Jr. keep bringing it every weekend um, like he has been. So that's what I'm looking for most to this weekend. Feel free to, you know, shoot us your questions, guys, for next weekend. Uh, follow us on social media. We're at Pro Lacrosse Talk on both Instagram and Twitter. So that wraps up Episode 6. We'll talk to you guys next time. And, uh... Thank you for listening to Pro Lacrosse Talk.